Yeah, I love that guy. Um, welcome to everybody on the live stream, wherever you are in Texas, and especially to those in North Texas, as we get to meet with some extraordinary leaders and educators in the Dallas Independent School District. And I'm gonna briefly introduce everyone around the table. Uh, you all let us know if you can hear us okay. We're experimenting with a new microphone. And Cindy, you tell me if you get feedback. On, I will, I'm on, looking on, out on right now. Mic. Okay, um, to, to my immediate left is someone that you may be familiar with from previous live streams. And it's a good friend of mine named Miguel Solis. Uh, many of you met Baby O in 2018 as we followed her story, extraordinary young woman. Um, Jacqueline Miguel, her parents, he's a former DISD trustee, very engaged civic participant in this community, and he's going to be joining us in this conversation. To his left, uh, and I guess on your screen to your right, is Michael Hinojosa. Dr. Hinojosa is the, is the superintendent of Dallas Independent School District, and actually I've, we've, I've spoken to him before. I just talked to him for about 10 minutes before we started the live stream. I'm already writing down uh, pages full of information, stuff that I'm gonna steal from him. Um, re really great way to look at leadership and education. So we're, we're looking forward to, to hearing more from him. Justin Henry, uh, who is sitting next to the superintendent, is the former board president for Dallas Independent School District. We're looking forward to his contribution to the, to the conversation. Next to him is Macario Hernandez. Dr. Hernandez is a principal at one of the early college high schools. We're gonna hear more about that really exciting program in DISD. And then next to Macario is Raquel. Raquel Stewart is a principal at a high performing middle school here in the Dallas Independent School District. And as I learned from the superintendent, she's been responsible for some extraordinary leadership at a number of different middle schools within DISD. So we're really excited about this conversation because hearing from you, you've told me that public education and the quality of our schools and the level of instruction and the outcome for our kids are the most important issues for you. So I wanted you to hear from some of the leaders in the state who we hope are gonna show us how we can replicate and scale some of the best practices um, out of DISD. So with that, Mr. Superintendent, I wanna to turn to you and if you could just give us a, a top level view of what's going on in Dallas right now, what some of your big successes are and, and how you and the board were able to make them happen. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for coming and getting some input from us. It's very refreshing that you're doing this with us. Uh, part of it is it takes time, but you need to have impatience and you need, you've got to have, because uh, we're dealing with people's two most prized possessions, their kids and their money. And yeah. so you've got to deliver on both. And so, uh, I've been superintendent of Dallas 13 years, although I took a little break and came back. And we believe in strategic initiatives. And none of us really know what's going to happen five years from now, but all of us know what's going to happen 18 months from now, personally and professionally. And every quarter we pierce the next quarter, so we can see things develop on the fly. And that's what has allowed us to innovate. In Dallas, we believe in the good IRS, incubate, replicate, and scale. And I'm going to talk, I'm going to actually have the team talk about some of the things I'm most proud of. Let me tell you the why, and we're gonna have Macario tell us the how. Okay. The why is, I was, we were very frustrated. He, before they got on the board, we were very concerned that in 2009, only 7% of our students had any kind of post-secondary credential six years after high school. So, so just to break that down for folks, so I graduated from high school at, at 18. Uh, by the time I'm, I'm 24, chances are, I, I not only have not gone to, to college or don't have a, a college degree, I don't have an associate's degree, I don't have a welder's certification, I don't have a hairdresser's uh, certification, I, I've got no post-secondary training at all. That, that's what was happening in Dallas. That's correct. And we know that that is connected, correlated to income, and that 40% muscle menos of Texans are earning less than the living wage today. Hard to get that living wage if you don't have that post-secondary certification. So how did you all meet that challenge? Well, um, thank you for that, and you're absolutely on target. So how do we do it? Well, let me just tell you what the results are. In 2011, in a pandemic, 10% of our students graduated from high school with an associate's degree. You said 2011, you meant 2021. In 2021, yeah. thank you, Beto. Yeah. I talk so fast, I can't even think <laughs> sometimes. But th that is accurate, uh, and that means so 10% of the kids walking across the graduation stage to shake your hand or 
uh, uh, the, board members hand, do that. the board members' hand, um, they're not just picking up their high school diploma, they're picking up an associate's degree. Absolutely. That's That's easy. Easy. Because we have a partnership with Dallas College, and we have 150 industry partners in our community that help us. So, um, and it's part of PTEC, Pathways in Technology. And so okay. it's a three-legged stool. It's the school district, it's the community college, and it's an industry partner. And for the industry partner, like American Airlines, who just hired 10 kids from Adamson High School making $58,000 a year with uh, a 401k and free flights, um, those kids are now going to have more than a living wage. They're going to have a very comfortable, and most of our kids are bilingual. 48% uh, of our students are English learners. We have more English learners than El Paso has students, than San Antonio ISD has students. And yet these kids are wow. delivering. And what we did, we knew the early college model would work because Macario was a principal of, uh, of one, and we had three that were phenomenal. But the problem was the rest of the school wasn't phenomenal. So we took that model and put it into comprehensive high schools and two to start with, Samuel and Spruce. Their results were phenomenal as well. So then we went to scale. In 2016, we did this at every high school in town. And p -Tech, the industry partner is low risk and high reward. They get to come in and mentor the kids. They take them to the job. You're talking about the industry partners industry who come in? Yeah. They take them to the job site. They teach them the important skills. They used to be called soft skills. These are negotiation skills, mm -hmm. how to interview. Then they give them an internship. And if they don't like them, they don't have to hire them. But Thompson and Reuters, IBM, American Airlines, they're hiring our kids. Makari, tell them a little bit more about how Man, it, it is, it, it's really about transformation. We're talking about, you got to ask, in 2013, Obama went to visit Brooklyn p -Tech, right? He made, talked about it, the State of the Union address and everything. That school, he said, we need to create more schools like this. I'm telling you, Dallas ISD took it to a whole other level. They just didn't take the rhetoric and he put it into action. And it really transformed. That typically is a six year, the traditional p -Tech is six years. We're doing this magic in four years. And when you say four years, four, four years, years to get whatever, PTAC yeah, so four implemented years. in so, school. No, when I'm saying four years for students to be walking out with an associate's degree gotcha. and their high school diploma, you know, for this year, the big year for us, we're going to, out of 109, we have 107 associate's degree. We're at 99% of our students are going to walk out. And it's amazing. you got to talk about, we talk about percentages, but every percentage has stories. Every percentage has people. Every percentage has a family being impact that's going to transform the rest of their future. I mean, we're changing the trajectory of these people, of, of everyone's lives by focusing on what's in our own backyards and, and some of these initiatives. You look at the numbers here, for example, for the 10% that are coming out. We're, we're looking at kids that actually did celebrate two college ceremonies, I mean two graduation ceremonies. And the funny part about this is the kids graduate because college has a graduation in, in mid-May, and they have the high school graduate, so they're graduating with a, with a college associate's degree before they get their high school diploma. And that's something we joke about, but imagine these families and the way they're transforming the kids that go visit that graduation. The family members that are growing, they grow up, it's the same neighborhood that I grew up there in Oak Cliff and where we grew up. They're actually changing their entire, they're seeing their, their, their brothers and sisters graduate. They're, they're showing up to a, a college graduation before they even get to a high school graduation. We're talking about being really transformation. Honestly, I think it's unmeasurable. But because of the power it's making, the, the everlasting impact it's having in this future. How, how do we make the case to, I, I see the benefit for the student and the student's family, undoubtedly. How do we make the case to the taxpayer because I'm going to assume there's a cost involved in providing that dual credit education. Well, the state, 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 okay. One of the things that I thought during my first term was they wouldn't give community college dollars and us dollars because we had the same kids together. So there were some laws passed that made that neutral. This really doesn't cost a lot of money. This board got. They, well, they funded the infrastructure for P-TECH mm. five years ago, and then now it's part of our DNA. It's so, uh, it doesn't take a lot of money, it just takes courage. Is it popular money. with, with uh, voters, taxpayers, parents, folks who live in, in Dallas, do, do they like what they're seeing? I mean, this seems very positive, but I'm sure every program is, in a, one as new as this, is gonna have some risk and some detractors. Uh, the only detractors I said, Doc, I didn't get in. What about us? <laughs> so we started the Career Institute. So in Dallas, if you're in the top quarter, uh, international baccalaureate or advanced placement, you go on to college in spite of us. P-TECH and early college created a second quarter. Mm. Our third and fourth quarter, if you're in those co courses, at freshman, you either have to take principles of technology or principles of construction. 
And then we put you in a career institute. We're teaching our kids how to be pilots, how to work on cybersecurity, megatronics, HVAC. We want, we're creating jobs of the future. And this board was courageous enough to fund the board. Was that part of the TRE? No, but that was, that, was, that was not part of the TRE. But we got a couple other topics. I, I want yeah. in a moment to we'll talk about see. school turnaround. I want you to talk about public school choice because you're a parent and you're going through it right now and it uh, addresses charter schools and our approach. And I want you to talk about PK, pre-K, because all of these are, the, are other big strategic initiatives. So Raquel, why don't you talk about how you turned around school, both ML, MLK and the now day and what, what you've been doing. Okay, so one of the district's biggest initiatives that we have in place is ACE, Accelerating Campus Excellence. And as the principal of Dr. Martin Luther King Learning Center, which is an elementary school in South Dallas, the area where I was raised, the school actually, when I entered, was a D rating in less than one year. MLK ended up with a B rating. But how'd, you, how'd you move Texas. up those two additional grade levels? How'd you get? There is a strategic focus on data. There's also a strategic focus on climate and culture. When you walk into our campus, my former campus, you will see joy. Students are mm. thriving. Also with the ACE initiative. How do you do that? That sounds great, and, and I've got to think that's really hard. That's got to be the toughest thing in the world to change the culture of, of, a, of an organization or an institution or a school in this case. How, how did you make joy um, paramount? In, wow, in a lot of people ask me that. One of the things I want to say that the district does is with the ACE initiative, we are able to recruit some of the top teachers in the district. It starts with great hiring. When we get the teachers in the building, we have a focus. When you have happy teachers, you have happy students. We constantly meet, we analyze the data, and again, our kids are thriving. Mm. At Dr. Billy E. Day Middle School, where I was the assistant principal, under a great leader there, the campus also moved from a D rating to a B rating in two years. Mm. Being the principal of MLK, I had great joy. It is now becoming a performing Arts Academy for elementary school students in a building that has been closed in Dallas, the Forest Theater, will now be a haven of excellence in our community. I love that. Th of this is one of these things we want to scale, right? We want to, this is a great individual story on these campuses, but now let's see this district wide, let's see this statewide, right? Yeah, that, that's so exciting. That's wonderful. We, we uh, my wife, wife Amy and I have a child in elementary, <coughs> in middle and in high school, all in public schools in El Paso and school district. And so that, the, you know, I'm really concerned about um, reading at grade level in fourth grade. I'm really concerned about high school graduation rates. I'm really concerned about post-secondary certification. But what you just said on joy, I'm really concerned or interested in the climate in which kids are learning and those uh, social and emotional aspects of education that so often aren't measured, maybe are immeasurable, but are so important to the outcome for those kids. And it sounds like you've really figured something out and we need to build on that. That's really exciting. Also, I wanna talk about how this year at the district, we also have mental health clinicians on our campus. Mm -hmm. So right at our students' fingertips at a middle school, where we've been in the middle of a pandemic, all students are back on campus. You have access to someone who's non-judgmental, who you can talk about your issues with. Talk about a game changer. Is that the exception in DISD? I mean, do other middle schools have mental health clinicians? Mm -hmm. No, I'll take that back. It's a new, a new initiative that we started. I asked a rhetorical question of my staff, why would I ever suspend a student again? Um, then what they came back to me was the concept of reset centers. Now, if you get if you get a certain level of offense, you will be suspended, but you will be said those are the most. We, we discovered that 80% of our suspensions were discretionary; they were not mandatory. Mm. So what we do now at every secondary campus, we have a mental health professional. We no longer have the offensive coordinator of the football team. Who's <laughs> <laughs> The beat the kids down and say, sit down, boy. The Sox are going to win state, I hope. But that offensive coordinator is doing football. And we've got mental health professionals that are changing the lives of these kids. But we're trying to change the behavior, yes. not punish the kids. The yeah. So it was a new initiative that the board was very supportive of us. I do want uh, Justin Henry to talk about either that or also talk about you know, public school choice. Yeah, I'm going to start with that policy when we look at the data there. 
folks that were getting suspended in your, your deeply past productions as well were, were black students and their language learners. So not only do we recognize this is a bad thing, but it's disproportionately impacting people of color. Um, and our board and our superintendent made a commitment around that. Um, you know, look at our black kids and you know, look at the story. She, she, didn't, she cannot describe the amount of joy that you feel when you walk to her campus. Um, mm. If I'm having a bad day, that's where I need to go. Um, <laughs> she tried to and she has a lot of energy, but you, can, you have to feel that. It's amazing. So, let me be more specific. 10% of our students are African American males. 51% of our suspensions were African American males. Wow. So incrementalism is innovation's worst enemy. So sometimes you just gotta blow things up and try something different. So, so we're wow. doing two things. Our black kids are more violent than every other kid in the district, or there's something systemically wrong. Yeah. We know there's something systemically wrong. The yeah. work that the superintendent does, our educators do, so we're addressing it in a lot of different ways. Um, so I think we wanted to talk about schools of choice as well. Um, Something I'm also deeply passionate about. You know, historically, in this district, there's been parts of our community um, that have received options, IB programs, school and language programs, all these nice things, Montessori programs that parents and you know, data shows it's very clear they're successful for kids. We wanted it everywhere. Um, so, with the school, MLK, again, the ones at Arts Academy, that's one of our schools of choice. So, what I want to be very clear is that MLK's Arts Academy is specifically for the kids that live in that community, high parents. They always have access to this, but what we're also recognizing is that we want to attract other families to that school as well. We want to be so successful, so excellent, that not only people in our district want to come there, but other people come. I was visiting this school, I think it's only San I won't name the school, but a school in our district. Can I name another school? Sure, absolutely. So, so I'm visiting the school as a parent. I had two VISD parents, students were thinking about sending our kids to the school. There's seven parents on the school. Two of those parents are from South Lake Carroll. Um, and often people talk about the EISD and all this, but they're seeing what we're doing with our comprehensive schools, our OTI schools, the criminal education, and they're very interested in wanting to send their kids there. So, I mean, it provides an option, one, primarily for our families that are in our community. That's who our primary is served. But at the same time, they're, they're performing and providing opportunities that are different. We have dual, we have dual language. We have single gender, both male and male. We have, we have STEAM Academy, STEM Academy, Montessori. I mean, they kind of just, there are so many opportunities for kids in our district. When you say choice, I just want to make sure because that, that word is very charged in education and it means different things to different people. I think what I hear you saying is that a, a parent who whose children live within DISD can choose the campus that best fits the educational opportunity that they want for their children. And so if we're really excited uh, about what you're doing, Raquel, um, and, and our child, you know, we thrive in that environment. Uh, do we apply to yeah, so serve for that, or how, how does that work? We invest in our neighborhood schools. A lot of short schools are neighborhood schools. Um, so we invest in our neighborhood schools, but at the same time, we know parents have different. Some parents, I want to see my kids go to all the school. Whatever reason, I want to see my kids go to all the school. I want to go to a school that's you know, sticking on science, going on engineering, arts, and math. So we want to give parents an opportunity for the district to do that. There's other schools um, within our district, maybe close to your neighborhood, maybe not so close to your neighborhood, you apply to get into and send your kids there. And it's wildly popular. Um, we're, you know, the IRS, I can't do that because we're a doctor. But we're, we're, we're replicating them, but we're going to continue to support our neighborhood schools. But we understand it's high demand um, for a lot of these. Um, we want to meet the needs of our parents. It's talking about partnerships. We're part of UT Southwest, and we have a biomedical school. That's and the, awesome. And the principal that we're hiring at the school was the principal of Stevens Park, the Latino, but he was a surgeon in Colombia. And he is now the principal of this new school. And, and we, we partnered with SMU and Toyota to have a STEM school in West Dallas, and they have brought so many resources to our families. We partnered with A&M Commerce and North Dallas Chamber to have an international school in, in North Dallas. So, Miguel, you were going to say something about the choice. I was going to add, there's a really unique element um, for some of these choice schools, and it's growing. In 1954, Brown versus Board of Education happened. Um, and if you look at the data today in our district, you'll see that we're still a hyper-segregated school system. Mm -hmm. And that happened for a whole host of reasons, and that, you know, the history is a true story. But one of the things that we realized was, look, if you can mix socioeconomics in schools, you actually can see exponential academic output of all kids. And no kid's education gets worse. All kids rise to the level. So some of these schools are called mixed SES schools, where 50% of the kids who get in have got to be from lower income families. What is SES? Socioeconomic okay. status. 50% okay. of the kids have uh, got to be lower income uh, families, and the other 50% have got to be middle to upper income families. By the way, I'm having, at 11 o'clock, I'm having a call with Kennedy School of Harvard about this 
very top. Mm. And what you see is, I mean, it sort of sounds like a wild idea. Will, will parents actually buy into that? Particularly, will, will middle class parents buy into that? Because for far too long, they've not chosen the traditional public school system. Every one of those schools has got wait lists trying mm. to get in. And the academic output of those schools are some of the greatest schools. Some of these schools are out competing some of the suburban schools. Yeah. Well, we didn't say anything about the PTEC. I'm sorry, the P all the PTECs in our college unit. At our school, we're 87 percent social economic, and these schools. Some of the kids we have criteria even from the state saying that a lot of these kids haven't even, when they were in eighth grade, they didn't pass the yeah, test. Yeah, a third of these kids have failed a star exam in eighth grade and got an associate's degree four years later. That's that's amazing. Amazing. See, see, that's a part of the story that I want to make sure we get out. And you know, we just, I just recently came from Washington and got the national received the national blue ribbon. Two of the great colleges in the city in the data were national blue ribbon schools. So this is transformation. And three mm -hmm. years ago, we got the national title one award. Now. People don't say this a lot, but that's a little tougher than the Blue Ribbon, but the Blue Ribbon gets all the love because that's when you have to show five to seven years of data and you have to be national type, you have to be a Title I school, 87, 87% socioeconomic. So that's the outcome of some of these schools. We're really transforming this community. One of the, one of the questions we just got, oh, sorry, I want to make sure that no, we I was saying, you were they're talking about transformation, accelerated transformation, and in thinking about student social economic background, Dr. Martin Luther King, in 2018-2019 was the number one elementary school in the state of Texas for student academic growth on the STAR test, which was the last time we took the assessment before the pandemic. Number what, one. What year was that? What year was 2018, that? 2018-2019, yeah. right, right before the pandemic. Number one for student growth mm -hmm. in, in the state of Texas. In the state of Texas. That's, that's incredible. What, one of the questions that, that came in on the live stream that Cynthia just passed over to me, was about special education. Very, very often, special ed students and parents are left out of the conversation. And the, the concern is, and my sister was in special ed for the entire time she was in EPISD schools, is that they're not gonna get the resources or the attention or be the focus of the innovation that we're describing for other students. Can you talk a little yeah, bit about how you, how you get this population? Yeah, in fact, when I was, every, I've been a superintendent for 27 years. And every district I've been in, we had about 10% of our students were special needs. My parents had uh, 22 uh, grandkids, two of them were special needs, same percent. By the way, I'm, I'm an immigrant, I'm proud to be born in Mexico. So immigrants, we get the job done. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but what, what I'm talking about, out of my parents, two were special needs, 16 graduated from college, and the other four went to college and didn't graduate, including my boys went to Harvard and Princeton. Mm. But let's go back to the question you asked. There was a state and suppression of the number of students we could serve. It was an artificially low number. Mm. And the state of Texas had to fix it because we could only have six or seven percent of our kids in special ed. Well, we got way behind. But I'm very proud of my team this year that we finally did all the assessments, caught back up. We welcome and encourage students that are in special ed to yes. apply to all of these programs. Yes. So it's not perfect, we're getting better. But we've made significant progress, and we're doing a much better job of identifying our students. The other thing I say on this is that, from a board standpoint, you know, and, and this is actually a personal thing for me because Olivia is going through some mm -hmm. education issues uh, related to the, the health issues that she has. Um, but until you start really talking about this stuff on a consistent basis, um, you never really, you never really get to it um, mm -hmm. because it, this system is so massive. We're talking about 150 something thousand kids. We created an equity department, mm. Mm. Um, yes. and we put, I don't know, how many millions of dollars in yes. this department? So, just to make sure that we were consistently thinking about those who have traditionally been the least served. Mm. Uh, and in doing that, it's, 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 it's just interesting to see how people, when you say we're going to focus on these particular mm -hmm. things, we're going to look at data for special education students consistently, not just like once a year at the end of the year in some massive Excel spreadsheet, yeah. how the system can quickly change to make the culture be serving those who are uh, the most important when it comes to these things. So. That, that which is measured tends to improve, exactly. right? And, and we haven't been looking at these special needs students traditionally, present company excluded, but I think as a state, we haven't been doing that. You were going to say yeah, something. Yeah, I something to this point when you talk about racial equity. Um, we also had stuff like early learning that we invested in. You mentioned earlier, like, where was the community at with the stuff that push and pull? I mean, we asked for our tax credit for racial election, put it out before the vote, and explicitly said we're investing. 13 cent tax increase, the voters voted yes. We're investing in racial equity. We put it before the company, they told us yes. 
Um, so it's, it's not only the superintendent and our educators, our principal and the board, but as a whole, in my opinion, the community in Dallas has got behind us. I love that you in, said that. In these regards. I mean, we're not doing it in a opposition to the yeah. community. Yeah. believes in race. Right? You want it. parents involved. You want taxpayers involved. Right. And they got involved. And they said, you know, we, we like what you're doing. We're, we're willing to take on a 13 cent uh, increase in our taxes. No one is going to be invested in early learning. No one is going to be invested in race. Right? And to the state's credit, House Bill 3 was based yeah. on a lot of our initiatives. Um, and other people are implementing some of it, but no one is doing it at scale. That gets us to something I want to make sure that we, we touch on before we close, which is uh, you started us off with this idea of the good IRS. You're going to incubate a great idea. You're going to replicate it uh, across the, the system. And then you're going to scale it. And when I think of scale, I think of 30 million people in the state of Texas and all the kids that we want to serve in this state. What could we as a state be doing better uh, when I look at the, the numbers, and, and I'm sure you outperform these numbers, but you know, 70% of fourth graders are not reading at grade level in the state of Texas, which really, really concerns me. Our level of post-secondary certification is incredibly low and, and lower than almost any of our peer states. Our per pupil spending is about $4,000 less than average, and our teacher pay, and as a former educator, you know this, and as current educators, you know this, our teacher pay on average is about $10,000 less per teacher than the national average. It's just to get to average. So I've got to think money is part of it, resources are part of it, um, but I'm certainly hearing a lot about innovation and focus. Um, tell me what you think as a state we could be doing better, either to replicate what you're doing or to do some things that you want to do but haven't been able to do so far. Well, I think if everything is important, nothing is important. So you have to have focus. And I want Miguel to talk about it a little bit because he's up to me with another project with some of the urban districts about if you focus on certain goals and you drive those and you put, and we always complain, sometimes we're going to have to stop doing stuff, strategic abandonment, so that we can do other things. It may take new money, we call that a fiscal note um, or an exceptional item, but a lot of times it just takes courage mm -hmm. and it takes focus. So Miguel, why don't you talk about the goals that you're helping us develop? And especially about the early learning piece, and I'm going to add something about even before the early learning piece. It, it's not, it, the research have been clear for a very, very long time that if you can get a kid prepared as early as possible, uh, three or four years old, three, four, five years old, you can get them prepared really early, they're going to be literate, they're going to be ready for kindergarten. And if you keep them ready for kindergarten, you keep focusing on critical elements using particular curriculums and particular pedagogy, that by third grade, they're gonna be literate. And if you're literate by third grade, the chance of you being successful for the rest of your academic career is through the roof. Um, and our data played out the same exact way now that we focus on pre-K and, and have been trying to expand it all the way to universal pre-K. Um, and at the end of a career, a lot of the stuff that, that Makari was talking about, we ensure that a kid is ready for the 21st century. They may not, it may not be that they end up going to college or even getting the associate's degree, but it, they should be prepared to do that. That's right. right. And they also, also should be prepared into the workforce in a way that actually makes them competitive. We know what the things are they have to do. And we need the state to continue to recognize that putting money behind transformational strategies like that uh, is the thing that's going to move the needle. Now, as, as Dr. Hain also said, they've done that, or at least they did some of that. This last legislative session was crazy. And so Even that you didn't have the focus on the these has, opportunities. The state needs to yeah. stop doing things that way. They need to stop worrying about strong or creating strong. Stop yeah. worrying about curriculum. Stop worrying about these political things. Because what we just experienced with COVID, all of the amazing things that you just heard, it's all at risk now. Mm. Because a once in a lifetime pandemic came in and hit us and took all that academic progress and basically got us back to where we were a decade ago when we started this work. No well, silver bullets, but I'm going to give you a silver bullet. Yeah. We, we started another initiative that's just being incubated right now. And it's called, uh, at first we called it um, Legacy 2050. So what am I talking about? Um, Project Legacy 2050. Then we changed the name to Start Strong Dallas. If you wait to third grade, it's too late. Three, three years old, it's too late. Dr. Ron Ferguson from Harvard, MIT trained economist, says that the brain develops by the age of two. 
So the reason that my boys went to Harvard and Princeton is that my, when I was in El Paso, my, my, we would drive from Dallas to El Paso every holiday, and my wife was reading to my boys before they were born or when they were infant, infants. And I used to make fun of her. Well, <laughs> that's why they went to Harvard and Princeton. Yeah. <laughs> so now she's making fun of me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we start strong Dallas is read, talk, and play. If you can start doing that with infants, Beto, you know how old you and I are going to be in 2050? Because that's how long it's going to take. And a lot of, a lot of people look for instant gratification. Yeah. But if you look for transformation, that's what it's going to take. So we need to marshal the whole state. In middle class families, do they read, talk, and play in zero to two? Absolutely. And if you have two loving parents and you read, talk, and play, those kids are going to make it. A lot of our kids don't have that. Mm. That's what's going to take. You, uh, when, when I was mentioning the disparity between the average for teacher or educator pay in the country and the average in the state of Texas, I thought about something that I heard earlier, which is that you have a number of high-performing educators here who are earning six figures in, in DISD, and I've got to think that has an impact on attraction and in retention, and you don't have the costs of turnover that so many districts struggle with. You might know the, you, you all may know the, the, the number, I've forgotten it, but some frightening number of teachers leave the profession within the first few years. So we spent all this money training them, they've answered the call, and we lose them. What was your key in retaining them and keeping them within the district? Well, that, that's a great question. We have strategic compensation. It's called uh, the Texas uh, the Teacher Excellence Initiative. And this was started by my predecessor, and we, we made it work. Uh, and the board was very courageous, and people told us it couldn't happen. I, was, I read an interview where 48% of the teachers right now are thinking about leaving. I just sent a mess, uh, message to the board that we're so lucky in Dallas that we have lower turnover rate than the state of Texas, lower turnover rate than the region, lower turnover rate than any suburb in Dallas. We're going to have one teacher make $131,000 this year. We're going to have um, 73 are going to make over 100000 But part of it is we've gone to new round schools at 46 campuses, and those teachers are there because they get to earn more money because they work longer and they work harder, and you've got to deliver. And I used to have to go to Puerto Rico, Mexico, and Spain to get bilingual teachers. Now we just go to Oakland. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're developing our own pipeline. These kids, these kids uh, go to and get the associate's degree, and they get the four year And they become and teachers. They become yeah. I, I love teachers. that. Yeah. And we used, to, we used to not, again, the press company excluded, but I think the conventional wisdom was that English language learners were a burden and That's a problem. They're a challenge. Massive. Like, poor us, we have to do. Now, now we see them as we a benefit, dual as language. an asset, as our future. Right. Right. Yeah. We have dual language at every campus in Dallas. Yeah. Yeah. We have one-way dual language for monolingual Spanish speakers. Get to keep and become bilateral. Then we have two-way. And these are white kids. The name Beto. I mean, no, they're not named Beto. <laughs> they were Robert Francis. Or <laughs> and you have African-American kids. And you have second and third generation Latinos who don't speak Spanish who yeah. are becoming literate. I love we it. have 35 of those campuses all over town. Yeah, mm -hmm. I love it. Can I, can That's I great. One yeah, one? yeah. Um, on the idea of um, you know, educator pay, it's also about educator quality. And like we've had to create a system that does two things. One, it it increases what we ask of our educators. We ask them that you know when you show up, you've got to be moving the needle. Um, but there's sort of this theory of reciprocity there to say that for every increment of accountability we're asking of you, we want to give you an increment of support. And for far too long, the money hasn't been there. But we made very difficult decisions to ensure that the money would be there. Again, you've got to be moving the Support for training, support for Absolutely. making sure that you can afford to be a teacher. Absolutely. Do we have time for one more quick question? So I, I was at uh, an event in Odessa uh, uh, at the beginning of the week. And at the end, uh, two teachers came up, said hello, and they said, Beto, if you could do one thing, it would be um, these, these high pressure standardized tests that I feel like I've got to perform to. Anecdotally, and who knows the value of anecdote, but anecdotally, a number of teachers have said, you know, I'm no longer teaching this text. I'm teaching kids how to take a test and say, hey, don't read the first few words in this paragraph and skip to here and get the conclusion. That's what you need to know. And they worry that they're not preparing these kids to be the critical thinkers we want them to be. And it's also not connecting with the passion that they feel about the profession. They, didn't, they don't want to teach 
test taking. They want to teach the thing that they were called to teach. What What, what is your response to that? Uh, and, and how do we listen to those educators who say, hey, you know, judge me on what you've been able to do, the, the accelerated transformation in those schools, which has to be done with metrics and things that we can all observe and agree upon, but also this intangible that you've been able to bring to the equation, which is the joy and the, the sense of purpose that I think those kids and educators feel when they walk in there. How, how, do, we, how do we strike that balance? You can, it's possible. First of all, don't ignore the teachers when they tell you that. Yeah. However, though, in Texas, we're the godfathers of accountability. Remember, we made up No Child Left Behind, and went national and blew up. But you got to know where you stand. And you got to know, but you have, in Dallas, we have an alternative accountability system that the state allowed us to have. And 50% is what the state makes us do. But the other 50% is exactly what you're talking about. 30% of it is culture, and, 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 uh, and the other 20% is value added. How much did you move the needle for the kids? And there has to be multiple measures. But yes, the star test is nothing, it, it be all end all. In fact, like Macario said earlier, a third of our kids who got an associate's degree failed an eighth grade test and they got promoted to high school because the committee let them go to high school instead of letting them kicked out. So th that's part of it, but don't ignore them, but we gotta have some kind of measure and it needs to be multiple measures. And I'm working on a thing called the degree of difficulty index that I'm gonna try to push out later um, that makes it more fair for everybody. It's wonderful, wonderful. Why don't you have the final word? Yeah, because I, I, I'll send you the last thing. I'll make a point on that. Um, as a parent, too, I mean, when my child takes an assessment of some sort, I want it to help me deliver for my kid. I want it so the educators can help move my kid. And I think part of the issue with those type of standardized tests, I'm glad we went to math, which is what we incorporate math as a different assessment. It, it doesn't give me that. You get it, you see it, but I don't know, okay, well, what do I need to work on individually with my child? Mm -hmm. Or as, when I get a map to set what you use, I can have a conversation and dialogue with my children's educator, which I do, what do they need to work on, where are they at specifically? Not compared to state standards, but compared to other kids, where's my child at? Where do I need to move So I think mm -hmm. that's an important piece. And what I want to add is, when we talk about a love the story, I didn't know that about the eighth grade, you didn't star in there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the biggest indicator of how well you want to standardize tests, whether it's that test, the SAT, the PSAT, LSAT, whatever it is, and really other educators. Um, well, the um, education of your parents, some of that same stuff we were talking about on the front end of zero to three, who's getting access to zero to three? It's the middle class. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's not a lot of our family. So those scores aren't an indicator of their potential. Um, mm -hmm. It's more an indicator of maybe the socioeconomic status or the, the dynamics the of the factors family. in their lives. So yeah, yeah, no how many people, yeah. educators, school districts, Experience. around the idea? I mean, we're, what are we, um, mm -hmm. socioeconomic status right now? Uh, 92%. All the uh, other ones we have, it's a lot more difficult to do well, and we are doing a lot more like than it is if those dynamics are different. Um, so and I think we never apologize for you know, that. We love, we love our kids. When we say SES, yeah. socioeconomic status, is, is that equivalent to kids on free and reduced yes. breakfast yes. and lunch? And it's 92%? Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. But, you, but those kids that go in to grow your own, I mean, we're indirectly growing our own people. And what that does, the kids, the, the teachers stay longer, they make a connection, yeah. and they navigate around the star exam to put in some of that, some something that connects to their home culture. You know, we brought Mexican American studies, African American studies, and big, and so those kind of the, bring that. It's like you said, the, it's the whole schooling experience that creates that whole child, and also the teacher experience within that process of working with you. Yeah. This is by far one of the most inspiring conversations I've had on this subject because so often, and for good reason, we, we talk about the problems within our systems of public education and the challenges and the ground we've got to make up. Um, but there's a lot of success here in, in Dallas and your two campuses. I, I think are just prime examples of what we want to see across the state of Texas. I mean, almost every single child in, in your campus graduating with an associate's degree, they get that college education certification before they even have their high school diploma, which is amazing. Um, that I keep coming back to the joy in that campus, but also the measurable transformation from a D performing school to a B performing school within two years is extraordinary. And then all the risk that you all are taking as a board um, calculated risk, smart risk, risk that pays off that you measure and then replicate and expand. I, I just got to think that there is a model for Texas where we are right now. And I think you, you hinted at the fact that a lot of what has happened at DISD has been um, 
reflected in legislation that we see statewide. Yes. But to your point, we've got to keep that going every single legislative session. We, we cannot take our eye off the ball on the big things and you know, hopefully away from some of the, the, the things that divide us and, and keep us from, from achieving at this level. So we're, we're so excited for what you all are doing, so proud of what you're doing. I'm so glad the live stream, Cynthia, you've been getting good comments on the live stream about yeah, this. Yeah, a lot of great uh, folks that have said they've had their kids in uh, DISD and nothing but great experiences, so That's awesome. good stuff. Keep, keep up the work and thank you for allowing us to, to learn from you today and, and, and hear about these experiences and hopefully have an impact on other districts and what the state is doing.